There we go, I'll just start that again. Tutawa mai i runga, tutawa mai i raro, tutawa mai i waho, tutawa mai i roto. Ke tau ai te mauri tu, te mauri ora ki te katoa, haumie, huie, taikie. Kia ora koutou, lovely to have you all join us today for our next hot take. Um, today we're talking about biodiversity, a billion dollar question. So we have some excellent speakers lined up for you to kind of start unpacking this topic. Um, this came about just because we'd started to see quite a few more news articles and people talking in the space around biodiversity and the sort of financial barriers um, needed. We've also been focusing on this quite a lot um, within our nature team at SVN. So I thought it was a great uh, topic to explore this month for our latest hot take. If this is your first time joining us for a hot take, we're doing these monthly and they're an exploration of kind of new, exciting, sometimes slightly controversial topics um, around the sustainability space. And what I do is I go out to our network and find speakers from all those amazing businesses to kind of unpack a topic and try and get a bit of a range of um, different perspectives and opinions. So... Before we launch in, I'll just introduce you to our speakers for today. So starting us off, we have Pete from SVN. He leads our nature team. Kia ora, Pete. Kia ora. Next along, we have Philippa and Luke from Chapman Trip. Kia ora, guys. Thanks for being here. And then we have our team from Red Tree Environmental Solutions, and we have Phoebe and Andrew representing their team. Kia ora, guys. Awesome. So... We have, I think everyone, we'll probably have a few more people filtering in, but we might as well kick off. So um, just before I pass over to Pete, you're most welcome, like I said, to leave your camera on or off. Um, so we're gonna have the three presenters speak. That will take us till probably about 12.30 and then we have lots and lots of time for Q&A. So feel free to take a note down of any questions you have as we go, or you can pop them in the chat and I'll get round to them at the end. And um, you're also most welcome to pop your video and uh, microphone on to ask your question out loud to the panel at the end as well. So we will um, re kind of chat in with you guys. Uh, yeah, in about half an hour after these presentations. So I'll pass along to Pete to kick us off. Kia ora, Pete. Yeah, I'll just share my screen. Can you see that screen okay? Looks great. Kapai. Uh, kia ora koutou, ko Pete Tona, tukuangua. I'm Program Manager with SBN, uh, working in, in the nature regeneration space. So I'll introduce the topic, I'll talk a little bit about biodiversity in Aotearoa, um, some of the work that SBN's doing in that space, and just round it off with, you know, trying to capture the challenge that we've got around biodiversity decline and, and how to turn that around. So just, I mean, Aotearoa, we're, we're a, an isolated island. We've evolved um, very separately from the rest of the world. We've got incredible biodiversity. Um, around 80,000 endemic species, um, but we've also got one of the highest proportions of threatened indigenous species in, anywhere on Earth. There's around 4,000 species um, at risk, and we've got about 500 critically endangered, which is that last classification before extinction. So we've really got quite a... Um, a big biodiversity challenge in New Zealand. Um, in terms of the causes of that, uh, three quarters of our bush is, is being cut down. We've only got about 10% of our wetland, wetlands remaining. Our marine ecosystems are struggling. Um, and while we've made some gains in recent decades, um, and particularly some investment in iconic species, not to lose those, and for some particular ecosystems like um, predator-free islands, um, which, which are having some really good results, overall, we're still losing that battle of biodiversity loss. Um, and two main drivers of that, um, New Zealand native species, they evolve without mammalian predators. 
So they're very, they're very vulnerable to invasive predators, the big three, rats, stoats, possums, but there's a bunch of others. Um, those are having a, a devastating effect on, on our native species. And the other thing is the way we use land and resources is just another key driver of that decline. So those are big areas that we need to, um, to focus on. And, and the basic problem is that we don't have enough money, we don't have enough investment and resources going into turning that around. So that's, that's the kind of context for New Zealand. In terms of SBN's work in this area, um, we've got four, four main project areas, a million metres streams project's been going since 2014. And that model basically supports delivery partners, community iwi hapu groups that are doing fantastic mahi on the ground, restoring streams in areas of native bush and wetlands. Um, and so we've been working at ways of bringing funding and resources to those partners to enable them to, to carry out that restoration work. A, a subset of that is around the Hauraki Gulf. Um, we all know the, the Hauraki Gulf is struggling. Um, our focus in that space is to work on working with partners to restore waterways. And it's, it's mostly, it's, it's for biodiversity purposes, but it's to reduce sediment. Because um, sediment going into the Gulf is one of the key factors um, behind the decline of the health of the Gulf. Um, so that's another focus. A more recent project is this Pūnui Regeneration Project. Um, that, that really has come out of some fantastic work that the local iwi, Tiwaihua, and working with Iki Pānuku, have come up with this fantastic strategy, Te Whakaoranga o Te Pūnui. And so we're basing our work around that strategy. And the thing we're focusing on is activating the workforce based on local rangatahi to build the skills, build nature-based careers so they can help regenerate their local neighbourhood, their catchment in terms of the pūnui. Um, and that's, so that's got a lot of... Um, biodiversity benefits, but it's connecting urban communities back to nature. And it's also working to work closely with mana whenua, local youth, and trying to get local people connected and building that workforce, because there's a lot of infrastructure work happening in that, in that catchment over the next 20 years. So that's an exciting project. And the last one down the bottom there is another recent project around a nature regeneration investment partnership. And that's all about this challenge. How do we massively scale up investment in nature? And so we're looking with the whole collaboration of, of partners and interested um, people, how do we change the system? You know, how do we change the way that nature's looked after and, and viewed and invested in to make sure that we can turn this biodiversity decline into a healthy upward, um, upward sort of trend. The last thing about SBN I just wanted to share is that we've put a lot of work into providing website resources. Um, and a lot of it, it's, we've collated the best kind of guides and case studies and and put those together into a series of, of packages that people can go and find out a whole lot of ways to regenerate nature. And we've got two kind of pathways there, one focused on businesses and what they can do to make a difference. And the other pathway is around farmers, growers, rural landowners, and it covers a whole bunch of um, the best kind of ways of, of taking action. And so we've, we've done this because it's a very fragmented um, landscape out there and we've tried to bring into the one place useful guides. So um, have a look at that and um, keen for you to, to use those resources and share them widely. My last slide here 
it's really setting out that we have this massive need to scale up investment and biodiversity. Now, this figure of $10 billion over the next five to 10 years, that's kicked around as a figure. We don't exactly know what the amount is, but we just know it's heaps and heaps. <laughs> and we know the current investment is nowhere near what it needs to be. So we can't carry on incrementally trying to improve nature. We need some step change. We need some sort of circuit breaker to say, how do we really just all commit to, to investing in biodiversity? Now, the Jobs for Nature funding, that was 1.2 billion. And that was a fantastic example about the impact you can make if you put a big chunk of money in. And that was all focused on creating nature jobs. And we've participated in that and created hundreds of nature jobs through that funding. Um, but that funding's coming to an end soon. So what's next? Um, one of the key things there, and, and um, we'll have other presenters talk about this, is about how to create those financial mechanisms, create those markets to enable that ramping up of investment in nature. We've sort of done that around climate, around the carbon markets, we need some way of ramping up the investment in biodiversity so we get that huge investment. Some of the challenges I'll just finish with, there, there are quite a few challenges and barriers in the space in addition to just funding. Um, collaboration is a real challenge. How do we have a joined up approach, public and private? And that's what we're working on with that sort of regeneration sort of project. Um, the native tree nursery infrastructure, we know that that's inadequate to meet the projected demand for um, nature regeneration. We don't have enough skilled workforce to deliver that. Um, so that's another area that needs a big investment. Um, there's a lack of agreed impact measurement and reporting. A lot of people have done some fantastic work in that space and created some models for that, but we don't have a, a mandated sort of metric measurement system that everyone can actually gather consistent information and start to build some of that um, robust kind of logistical uh, knowledge behind this, um, this investment. Um, and then the last thing is that, you know, how do we leverage innovation and technology? And, and Red Tree is going to talk about some of the work they do in that space. So that's, that's the introduction from me. Kia ora. Kia ora, Pete. Thanks so much for setting the scene. That was great. Um, so now I'm going to pass over to Philippa and Luke to deep dive into that financial a little bit more. Thanks, we'll just... Uh... Slides up. There we go. Yep, perfect. Okay, so, I call Philippa Wilkie This is my colleague Luke Ford. Um, Luke has a specialisation in finance, um, particularly in green finance, but my um, area of expertise is more aligned with um, impact investment, uh, philanthropy, uh, in the non profit sector. So, we're complementary. <laughs> um, Pete's introduction was very useful. Um, we are only speaking to a piece of, um, of the picture that he set up. So obviously two key challenges. One is valuing nature um, in all decisions that are to be made by government business and all of us. The second key challenge is, is the funding gap. Um, so what we're going to be looking at in particular are um, different financing mechanisms globally and some case studies from New Zealand as well that um, can be inspiration, uh, but also have the challenges which we'll talk about at the same time. Uh, I thought this um, picture was quite useful. It is obviously a global statistic or set of statistics, not um, we don't have an equivalent that I'm aware of in New Zealand, but what, what it illustrates is that the majority of or the, the lion's share of biodiversity funding comes from governments. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the other pieces in that picture, such as the green financial products and um, philanthropy nature-based solutions. Um, 
as Pete says, the gap, um, if this is the funding spend between 124143 million US, the funding gap is supposed to be five to seven times that size annually. So we are talking some, um, some very substantial numbers. Um, there are lots of reports globally about what the different mechanisms might be. There are many, many, many different financing mechanisms and some of them are scalable and some of them are not. Um, the ones that I've put on these two slides are the ones that, that are um, evidenced as being scalable um, by organizations like OECD and UN, et cetera. So um, I'll quickly list them and then I've got case study slides to have a look at. So natural infrastructure projects and payments for ecosystem services. I've got some great examples. Um, there's a, a water bond um, and the reef credit scheme in the Great Barrier Reef, which we'll look at. Uh, Nature-based solutions and carbon markets, which is a, a, a burgeoning area, both in New Zealand and also overseas. Um, lots of green financial products. Um, Luke will talk about some uh, debt products in particular, um, bonds and, um, and loans, uh, and we've got an environmental impact bond um, example. So first case study I wanted to raise was, is dealing with um, poor water quality in the Great Barrier Reef, which is one of the um, uh, wonders of the world, uh, but is, is being degraded very fast. Um, Feeding into the reef are sugarcane farmers, and the Queensland government raised a $10 million uh, reef credit scheme whereby um, farmers that could show that they were reducing runoff of nitrogen into um, the water would be able to um, acquire or be given, would be issued with a, a reef credit, which was then um, it is a, a saleable product, a tradable product for them. Um, apparently there are not very many that are issued yet, about maybe 25,000 towards the end of last year. Um, they say they're trading at about $34 a credit, um, but as I say, Queensland government put into it 10 million. Um, uh, there's a lot of work behind it, a lot of parties were involved, they've got principles, they've got, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure behind a scheme like this, a bit like a carbon credit scheme. Um, so, so complex. Um, an example of nature-based solutions, we've got a lot of um, examples of reforestation um, and protection revitalization projects in New Zealand. This is an example of philanthropy being involved um, as a catalyst, but also drawing in collaboration. Lots of, um, they're doing it in lots of different sites. This particular one at Tamanuhuna Aoraki has uh, Runanga, private landowners, um, other philanthropists, Doc and Lynn's involved. They're reintroducing um, and breeding the kaki. Um, there's obviously predator control being undertaken and they are um, removing the uh, non-endemic species of plants. It's a huge, huge project. And as I say, they, um, they have these projects in a number of different places around New Zealand. Um, Next Foundation in particular is a $100 million ten, um, spend down over 10 year uh, foundation. Um, so the, th the interesting thing about philanthropy is not just to think of them as, as donors, but to think of them as catalyzers of um, you know, to bringing people together uh, in, a, in a project and obviously their risk appetite is different from a commercial entity um, and they can provide uh, different sorts of financial support like, um, you know, guarantees or concessionary debt or um, networks of people. Uh, so while actually philanthropy um, in, in the environmental space is quite a low percentage in terms of what um, people spend their um, philanthropic funds on globally. It is, um, it's an increasing um, spend, an increasing um, category of spend. Um, you will have seen the um, Bezos Earth Fund and other um, uh, foundations globally who've committed uh, five billion, five billion um, to protecting 30% of uh, land and sea by 2030. So 
that came in towards the end of last year. So I think you know philanthropy is definitely ramping up as a as a key contributor to these financial solutions. Um, this is a, just another example of collaboration where we've got um, in Victoria um, a local landowner who, uh, with a with a sheep ordinary sheep farm, um, sought assistance from a non-profit who agreed that they would assist with predator control, fence the property, and then reintroduce um, endangered species. And that's being carried out um, in different sites in in Australia. Um, we, this is an example of an environmental impact bond, but it's also um, green infrastructure. So DC Water is a you know water utility in, in the States. They had um, terrible stacks of runoff of storm water into the local bay. Uh, they had an option of just putting in more, another pipeline. Um, and then there was a slightly more risky option, which was green infrastructure, which involved um, permeable pavements, lots of planting, um, bio swales, um, which obviously both have health benefits and uh, a more enjoyable natural environment for, for people as well as um, absorbing the runoff. Um, and the way that this one worked was that the investors bore the risk of the runoff not hitting the targets that they were hoping for. Um, but it closed uh, or it didn't close but the um, the stats were taken after five years which was towards the end of last year they exactly hit what they were hoping to um, reduce in terms of runoff um, and um, and so they're increasing that project and it's being rolled out as a similar um, as in other in other places that's just the funds flows um, I won't go into this but it, um, a blue bond is uh, something that's a sort of a subset, I suppose, of green bonds. This one in the Seychelles um, was, I think, the first um, in 2018. And it was not just a blue bond, it was also a debt for nature swap, which has been done in a number of developing countries around the world who have very high debts at very high rates. Um, so this was a success, but it was only a $15 million raise, which is um, a drop in the very, very small drop in the ocean. Uh, but subsequent to that, the Nature Conservancy has um, agreed to purchase, uh, I think, half a, half a billion dollars of debt for Belize um, to, to replicate the structure. So whilst this doesn't look like it was a great success in terms of numbers, it's now being scaled um, in, in other areas. So, Luke? Yep, so I'll, like, I'll just briefly talk about the current green uh, bond market, just as a, as a sort of indicator of where or what, what the challenges are there. Um, so that's been around for about five or six years now in New Zealand. It's typically about three billion raised per year. Um, it's been sort of hovering around that number for a while, and it's been mostly focused on uh, green efficient housing and renewable energy. And kind of, I suppose the reason for that is largely that these are what we call use of proceeds bonds. So effectively the money is raised uh, and then applied towards specific projects. And the bond market typically requires about 50 million to 100 million to be raised at the time to make it worthwhile um, and to find investors. So you do need a relatively large, historically you need a relatively large asset base or project size um, and credit quality in order to, to access those markets. Um, there is, yeah, I mean, the, the main thing to know there is, there's a, there is like a small amount of um, insurance um, that goes with it, third party um, verification, um, require uh, you know, strong standards of reporting um, from, from issuers. Um, so that's been hovering around 3 billion a year in New Zealand. There is sort of an interesting uptick in uh, bank loans. Um, so from about a standing start a couple of years ago, that has uh, that had a larger year last year at about 3.3 billion. Um, that's the largely the four major banks, or the four or five major banks, um, lending money to to businesses, um, including Agri, uh, with not necessarily for the money to be applied towards specific projects that are going to um, have a climate impact, but with general business metrics applied. So effectively, if you you set some targets um, around carbon emissions, um, it could be any, any range of things, uh, social, environmental governance targets, 
and if you meet them, then you may get a, a or you, you get a decrease in your the interest you're charged. So it's an incentive to improve business practices generally, and that has had the benefit of a much broader base of businesses that can participate. Um, it's also been spurred, I think, a lot by the upcoming climate risk reporting that's coming up next year. Um, so banks have, have, have a, had another reason to focus on this beyond this general social um, obligations, uh, which have, have become more prominent in recent years. Um, and it's something that, that yeah, we, we, we see continuing to grow. I should note that sort of green bonds do, yeah, but under, as they're defined, they would include, allow or allow biodiversity targets to be included. It's just that we don't, haven't tended to see them. And as I say, I think the kind of required issue size of 50 to 100 million is often, um, and the need for, for general credit and risk requirements has, has meant it's been fallen to the back burner. But I do see that becoming a, um, an increasing target, um, particularly as the focus turns towards nature, nature-based targets. Um, very briefly, so we, we've, the sustainability linked um, approach has, has come to New Zealand that's in bond form. So that's the, the interest um, goes up or down based on achieving targets. Spark has issued one, um, but it's the only one to do so and it was restricted to wholesale only. So there is a bit to go from a regulatory side until that kind of that target based approach uh, makes the jump back into the bond, um, bond markets. It's, it's largely stuck with the banks at the moment. Uh, we're also expecting the Crown to issue its first green bond in the next uh, or, or the end of the year. They have announced their and published their sustainability finance framework. Sorry, it might be a green bond framework, sorry. Um, uh, that is available online now. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the idea that you should take from that is that again, it's, it's looking to build a general investor base in New Zealand for these products. So it's going to add significant liquidity um, into the volume um, and a reason for international investors to, to come here for green bonds, as well as to see what the pricing difference it, it makes. So we're expecting that to just generally facilitate a larger market. And I, I think that is one of the reasons that they are focused on that as well. Um, so I'll give a very brief run through. Um, I'm just going to whiz through this because we're a bit over time. These are obviously another four um, policy mechanisms. Um, budgets and tax policy, of course, can um, increase spending on biodiversity. Um, biodiversity offsets that have been highlighted as a, as a mechanism in the new national policy statement for Indigenous biodiversity. What's great about that is that New Zealand used to talk about no net loss when it came to offsets, and now we are finally talking about net gain, which is great. Um, sustainable supply chains. Um, if you're interested in looking at how they work, someone like Walmart have, have in their sustainability reporting, they um, have a great table on um, the different uh, uh, products and services or products that are in their supply chain um, and the mechanisms that they're taking to ensure that they um, uh, have better ESG ratings, you know, palm oil and coffee and um, pulp and paper and things like that. The last one is a sort of a political um, football, which is reform of subsidies um, that have a negative effect on biodiversity. Uh, and I have, once we sent these around, I do, I've got a few um, references that you can look at if you'd like to do some further reading. That's us. Kia ora. Thank you, guys. That was great. And yeah, we can share um, the slides in the follow up email with everyone if they want to dive deeper into that. Um, so that was a bit of a, a zoom out look and some experts in the financial space, but now we're going to go to a bit of a zoom in look from Bread Tree Environmental. So take it away, guys. Looking forward to hearing your stories. Kia ora koutou. All right, you can see that. Uh, ko whiri tuku ingoa, no ingarani o ko tipuna, ke te noho o ki o tautahi. Um, I'm Phoebe from Red Tree Environmental. Um, thanks very much for that insight, Philippa and Luke. That's really interesting. I'm um, just going to kick off by telling you a little bit about who we are, um, what we do, and then pass over to Andrew here. So um, Red Tree is based in Christchurch, um, where we have a native plant nursery, uh, an operational base, and a research and development centre. Um, our team fluctuates between about 10 to 12 people um, working on the ground towards our co-papa. 
Um, so we're going to be speaking from the perspective um, yeah, of, a of a company on the ground working to restore biodiversity in Aotearoa. Um, so our focus is on establishing mainly dry forest, uh, riparian margin and wetland ecologies. Um, the clients we work with being predominantly city councils, government agencies and regional landowners across the country. Um, so in order to give you a little more insight into how we work to restore biodiversity, I'm going to pass over to Andrew Cummins. Andrew's our horticultural director and ecological restoration specialist and has spent a lifetime in the bush learning and observing from nature. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Phoebe. Hi, everyone. I want to break um, this presentation into three parts. So I'll give you a highlight um, of our, where our research is, is focused. And then we'll look at two projects on the ground and how we've approached those to restore biodiversity. So forest ecosystems are my area of research and fascination and no better place than to kick off a discussion on biodiversity. In the commercial aspect of our business, paying our bills, we, we grow native plants and we take on ecological restoration projects, mainly native forest and wetland restoration. In our research, we focus on how we can do that better, more effectively and reduce the costs. So if we ask a question, how does nature grow a forest? The answer can seem relatively simple, but within that, there are fascinating complexities and nuances within the process. So for example, if we look at a forest edge, how does a forest edge grow? An observation, you'll find that seeds accumulate at a forest edge and they're either blown in by wind or they're deposited by birds roosting or leaving roosts. And it's not uncommon in spring to find between six and 12 seedlings germinating within a square meter. So if we compare this to how we go about native revegetation, most of the specifications or planning plans that we receive will have one plant per 1.5 square meters or with the billion trees model, one plant every three square meters. So what's going on here? Is nature overcompensating or is it generosity by design? And do seeds in situ do better in diverse communities and close proximities? So that's been a focus of our research. And the observations have led us down the path of what we call biomimicry, which is the observation and replication of, of nature's processes. So direct seeding equals biomimicry. And the question is, does it work? Well, yes, it does. Within environmental parameters and within certain successional pioneer species, we can be very successful at direct seeding. Now, what we've found is that seeds that germinate in situ are healthier, they don't suffer any transplant shock, and they're much more tolerant to drought. So this approach is a bit of a radical departure from traditional methods where a plant is grown in a nursery, there are designs, and then a human decides where the plant will do best. In direct seeding, we let nature and the environmental conditions select where each species will come up. So I want to leave that bit of the research there and then jump into a couple of projects um, where this has been demonstrated. So if we jump to Kaikoura, and it's November 14, 2016, 7.8 magnitude quake hit the region. Aerial surveys showed that there were over 100,000 slips between Kaikoura and Blenheim. And this was a huge loss of biodiversity. All these slopes were vegetated um, and ended up in the bottom of the valleys or in the sea. It took thousands of men and women over three years to clean this up, build bridges, reinstate roads, reinstate the rail. And our team got involved in the landscaping 
aspect of the project. So there were over 2 million cubic meters of slip material removed uh, to be able to open State Highway 1 again. And this was put into stockpiles. The coast was rebuilt. Um, our team put in 60,000 plants along the coastal corridor uh, in the safe stopping areas. And then we tackled the stockpiles because you've got to put 2 million cubic meters somewhere. Um, but these stockpiles, there were parts of them that you could not even put a spade into. The contractors were faced with importing 200 mils of topsoil from Blenheim, shifting that around with diggers and then planting traditionally into it. Our solution was to engage the project with a direct seeding model where we purchased the compost that was made from the recycled green waste in Christchurch and transported that to Kaikoura. We were able to deliver that compost through a pneumatic trucking system infused with native seeds uh, into the gaps between the rocks where you couldn't put a spade. And we've had really uh, been very privileged to be able to take this technology through a teething process and development process in a commercial project. In some areas it works terrifically, um, and other areas that struggle, but we found the parameters in which it worked and are now taking that forward in a, in a commercial application. So I want to finish off in um, Banks Peninsula. This is one of my favorite projects and this is Ridgecliff Farm. So obviously through Canterbury, we have a environmental deficit. We probably have 1% of our indigenous forests and wetlands left because obviously they've been drained or cleared for farming. Ridgecliff Farm, which uh, dates back to 1886, was purchased uh, by a pioneer. He had the funds to purchase this farm by digging the Littleton Rail Tunnel. At the time, it would have been covered in Totra and Matai, and that was the first economy, um, cutting down those trees and running them for timber. But this is a sixth generation farm, and the family that currently farm it have a, a strong sense of wanting to see um, sustainable farming practices alongside biodiversity. So they have a commitment to innovation and hard work. So farming practices are constantly evolving and there's a strong belief that um, you can have profitability without having environmental deficit. How we're engaged in this project is we come in, it's a 420 hectare farm. Um, they invited us in and we did a survey of the farm to find uh, the mother trees, if you like, or the native remnants where we could collect seed. Through the summer months um, and into autumn, we create a schedule of, of when certain species are going to come right, harvest those seeds, process them, and then germinate them over the winter in plastic houses, pot on in the spring, and then we have a, a new crop of plants to uh, traditionally plant over the winter months of June and July. The innovation uh, that we brought to this approach is in the first year, we just focus on palatable species such as Marnica and Carnica. And we put them at quite large spacings, but what that allows is the farmer can come in and they can graze their pasture for the first year. Because in any restoration project, maintenance is a huge factor in how much effort has to be put in. So the sheep do the maintenance in the first year. The second year, we introduce more uh, native broadleaf species, um, berry fruit, and, and this brings the bird life back in and really starts the biodiversity cycle. Because once you can get the birds back in, they'll be bringing species diversity as well. And it's in the third year that we, uh, we start to bring the podocarps back. There's protection from the elements, the slow growing canopy species, and noble trees go in which is the totoro, the matai, and the kakatiya on, on the damper ground. So there's been also an opportunity 
to work with the landowners at Ridgecliff to do further innovation. And if we go back to our direct seeding research, what we're finding is that there needs to be a radical reduction in, in the cost. So that within every farm budget, because every farm has areas of land that can be retired, uh, but the costs are fairly prohibitive to do large areas. So if we can reduce the inputs, uh, it'll be landowner led and there'll be far greater take up. The trial that we're doing this year at Red Cliffs is we've incorporated drone technology. And this is a uh, agricultural drone that has the capacity to lift 16 kgs. Underneath that, we have a, a seed spinner. And so we prepare our native seed but first of all, we bring in the livestock. So the livestock are doing the site preparation for us. Here we have a slide of Hamish, the landowner, and this is a flock of 200 hoggets. They'll come in and we've identified the land that's going to be retired. They've raised it heavily, um, and then the stock are removed. The area is sprayed with a, a mild herbicide to kill the pasture grass. And then the drone comes back in and spread the native seeds. Then the stock return. And if you have 200 hoggets, that means you have 800 feet and they push the native seeds into the soft ground during the winter. And this is a, it's a farming practice that high country farmers have used. If you can't get agricultural equipment in there, then you need to innovate and use the livestock to, to reseed pasture or clover. But we believe this method um, has great legs going forward uh, for native seeds as well. So stay tuned for um, results of that one, but we're very optimistic. Um, the future is uh, seeds in the forests and forests and legacy, and it's in our hands. And with that, I'll pass it back to you. Kia ora. Thank you guys so much. That was really um, interesting and cool to hear some really uh, exciting innovation going on in this space and hopefully we can see that um, continue to grow. I really loved that story about the farm and yeah would love to um, hopefully have an update sometime. We could do one of these again in a while and see what, where that's got to. Mm. Um, thank you to all our speakers. That was really great. And obviously hot takes are only an hour, so we can only really scratch the surface um, of these topics. And we know that there's a lot of deeper thinking, but it's a good introduction to kind of get us started and we can always revisit topics again. Um, but now we're going to open up the floor. So hopefully as you were listening, you were jotting down any questions you might have. So feel free to start popping those in the chat. Um, or you're most welcome to pop your video on and your microphone off and ask a question out loud. Um, I think there is a raise hand function under the reactions um, tool down there if you do want to do that as well so I can get to you. So does anyone have anything to kick us off or I can um, start with some of my own questions while you have a think. I can't tell Katrina if you popped your video on just so we can see you or if you have a question. Sorry, I tried to raise my hand. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation and I'm really curious about biodiversity and what we're up to in New Zealand. Um, I'm doing a lot of work in climate change area and I'm curious, is this, what do I need to be aware of or, or are there some dumb things that we're doing in the climate change and the climate action that you know we need to stop doing or there's some things that it'd be really good if we were over here a little bit more? because I'm just going to keep going on the climate change focus and I'd really like it to be totally aligned with biodiversity as much as it could be. Yeah, That's a great question. Thanks, Katrina. Um, does someone want to kick us off? Pete, you jumped your microphone off pretty quick there. I'll give it a try. Um, I mean, a really good question. And, you know, from from our kind of research and diagnostics and, and I guess my previous kind of roles in DOC for quite some time, um, the two systems of climate change and biodiversity have been kind of artificially separated. And, and you can see it in, in the, even the global thing where the, the COPs for climate change have no relationship to the COPs for biodiversity. And so it's those the parts of the same, you know, two sides of the same coin. 
because everything you do in climate change kind of impacts on biodiversity and vice versa. So we, we need to be thinking a lot more integrated that those two systems need to come together. And we, we see some perverse outcomes around capturing carbon, best way to do that, grow a whole lot of pines, but that has some perverse outcomes for biodiversity. And so there's some opportunities there of bringing those two together and solving the, the two issues by having joined up solutions. And that's something where we're really keen to, to work on. And we all need to um, commit to that journey of joining those two things together. Kia Great answer. Thanks, Pete. Um, do any of the other speakers want to add to that at all? Just briefly, I think that we have, um, we're in a period of instability and it's, um, I think he's completely correct that it's biodiversity actually creates the stability. And so the more that story is continued and the more biodiversity is established, will bring more um, stability back into the planetary processes. So they're very much linked and go hand in hand. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's definitely a conversation I have with um, businesses I talk to a lot around that carbon offsetting piece. And if buying offsets overseas is really um, the best thing to be doing or how, how we can kind of make those systems talk better to each other. And it's a topic that we might visit in a hot take at some point around um, carbon offsets and pines. And so definitely stay tuned for that. But yeah, thanks for that question, Katrina. That was excellent. Does any, oh, here we go. One in the chat um, is from Juanita, who's from DOC. And um, what would you say are some of the most controversial issues facing biodiversity investment? Do you guys want to kick this off from Chapman Trout? Yeah, sure. So um, there are quite a few. Um, and actually, uh, Pete had a little list um, on, one, on, I think, his last slide. One of the key points is obviously how do you measure whether you are achieving the impact that, um, that you want? How regularly do you do it? Is it measurable at all? Yes, it is, but um, uh, there's a, a lot of work needs to be done on, on the measurement side. Um, there's also people are... Um, people's risk appetites differ depending on what kind of investor they are uh, and some um, investments the, the risk of it not working out might be too great that's why we're seeing in some of the more um, innovative examples overseas where say for example the DC water um, company wasn't uh, able to take the risk itself on the failure of the green infrastructure. The investors um, were the people who took the um, took the risk, so they would pay if it didn't work out as as, as hoped. Um, what are other risks? Are those, those those are the key key challenges. I'd say from from my side, looking at the we've come from the climate change stuff, there will be a lot around how to measure and, and who, who agrees on what the measurements should be, which is something we're definitely still landing on on the sort of green bond space. Um, yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. Great, thank I, you. I just, just to add to that, I think the, the measurement side of it's really critical. Um, and, you know, how do you, how do you measure the, the gains and um, how do you lock those in, in, a, in a way that investors can say we're getting value for money and that's been sustained um, you know there's there's risks around um, flooding storms fires you know you can lose a whole lot of biodiversity investment through uh, natural events or, or otherwise and um, you know how do we navigate this so that you know it's still worth investing in it despite those risks but you know, the measurement frameworks around that really need, need a lot of work, I think. Good. Anything to add to that question, Red Tree team? It, it's a tricky one, and it's not our strong suit, obviously, but uh, I can concur with, with what's been said. Yeah, and really interesting seeing um, how the biodiversity was restored after that natural disaster as well as a kind of tie into that. Yeah. Um, great. Any, oh, here we go. Marin, take it away. 
<laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks all presenters, really thought provoking each one of you. The questions kind of linking between um, what you guys at Red Tree have been doing to where else could I be hearing or sharing the story of this trialing of more seed planting? I've been living up in Hong Kong for 15 years and we did seed bombs at times just throwing stuff into the bush, which is a bit mm. random in some respects, but that's nature in another way. So having been back here, is there, what's the best way to point you to, and I might say the local tree group that's doing stream care, that's still growing up nurseries, uh, that what's the best way or what's the way that it's been communicated out around this possible new technique to supplement the toolbox of uh, planting trees in tricky spaces? Mm. Yeah, well, great question. It, it is relatively, we've been in the research of this for the last five years, and it came about with the hard sites um, post Christchurch earthquakes, after um, houses have been demolished uh, because the environments were no longer safe to live in because of rock fall. Um, and we were getting very puggy clays to establish um, native vegetation on. So our research uh, began there and has continued on until this point. So we're about five years in, so it's relatively uh, new technology. It's been tried by land care research to um, transfer pasture into Monica and Karnika forests in the past with, with low success rates, um, but we're not giving up on it. We're, we're taking it forward and we currently um, have commercial projects. We, we manage around 20 hectares of direct seeded um, forest and wetland at the moment. And I guess um, how you find out more about it, we, we post regularly and do case studies on, on our website. And we're mainly working with um, Christchurch City Council and um, Wellington Greater Regional Council. Uh, they're the two councils that are engaged and inspired and you know, progressively want to see breakthroughs in this space. So that they would be the two regional councils that would be uh, promoting and, and writing about, about it as well. Cool, thanks. So just sharing that uh, in social media and channels of ourselves so more people hear about it and uh, going to see drone footage on the Wellington Regional one on your website. So yeah, I'll sitting here looking out at the wire wrapper planes at the moment going, yeah, there's not a lot of native nearby here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> swamp land thinking, how can we get Kaikadira or that back into that wetland? Um, uh, and seeing where they've hand planted it and thinking, oh God, that must have been fun. Um, thanks, team. And feel free to get in touch with us as well, Mary, and all our contact details are on the website. So we always, always love to chat as well. Cool. Thank you. And we'll also um, pop this up on our YouTube channel. So you're most welcome to share this video as an educational piece as well. Great. We probably have time for one more question if anyone has any um, anything on their mind either in the chat or through video. Kia ora. It's Rachel. Rachel. I've got it, Philippa and Luke, I loved your uh, information. It's really aligned with the research that we've been doing at SBN too. So it's, it's great to hear someone else presenting back on the stuff that you're going, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I'm curious, where do you think the best opportunity in terms of these, op, you know, these market mechanisms sit? We, you know, if you were going to pick, say, two or three of them, where would you put your effort? Um, I'll sort of answer that in the negative to start with. I think my, <laughs> what would you avoid? <laughs> yeah, not so much what would I avoid, but my observation of a lot of these pictures or structures is that they are incredibly, incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. and have so many different players um, that all play a different role. You know, you've got um, a sort of commercial investor and impact investor, banks, development entities, um, philanthropy, and there are lots and lots of things going on. So, I mean, I think New Zealand needs to, um, is better to, best to start with the things that it, that it um, is using a lot of at the moment. So obviously bonds, use of proceeds bonds seem to be, um, well accepted, um, crowns issuing them, um, you know, they, they, they could be blue, they could, in the, in the sense that their outcome, their proceeds should be used for sustainable fisheries, sustainable marine environment management. Um, I think simple, simple is good. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, on, a, on a sort of a smaller scale, I do expect the, the banks to pick up 
their focus on this, um, particularly as kind of general focus tends towards nature, nature-based risks and biodiversity. Um, and there is a benefit there of, of, as they develop those products, they can be used just for small numbers and then grouped together over time. But that's definitely st still coming. So I guess that, yeah, that one, of the, one of the key points at this stage is gonna be finding projects that are on a suitable scale and size and well-defined um, while still being narrow enough to kind of support a single, you know, single fundraise. Um, yeah. So there's a, um, a paper that uh, David Hall and a colleague have written about bio, uh, biodiversity instruments, and they've given five examples yeah. where they think they're scalable, um, they're you know, not too difficult, um, and we could use them in New Zealand. That's a, a, a good paper to read. Yeah. Yeah, we reference David's work a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rach. And I can pop... Um, links to all the great things we've been talking about in that follow-up email as well for anyone who's keen to um, read more. Um, did Pete, sorry, did you have something to add there? Oh, I, was, I was just, in terms of just reflecting on the work we're doing at SBN in terms of all these um, awesome community hapu groups and trying to, you know, develop investable projects with, with those partners and and how do we how do we build that at a scale that that's going to attract really good investment um, options for business? And start we're starting in the voluntary space, um, and there's a lot of interest there. But you know how do we build robust projects with the right metrics, really good impact reporting back, so it demonstrates the value for that investment. So it's an active space that we're we're working on. Good. Yeah. Great, thanks, Pete. Uh, Carissa, did you have a last minute question or just coming on to say, great, awesome, lovely. Cool, okay, well, that's probably all time we have for today. That was really um, great to hear from you all and thank you all for presenting and giving us a bit of your expert knowledge. Um, please stay tuned in these hot takes and feel free to get in touch with me if you have any feedback, further questions that I can pass on to our presenters or ideas of topics you'd like to see in the future. Um, next month, we're gonna be looking at B Corps. So tune in if that's something that you're starting to think about at for your business. Um, and I will pop all these great uh, resources in the follow-up email and also um, the presentations. So you can do a bit of further reading and get in contact with us if you have any questions. So thanks everybody. I will just close us off with a karakia. So, unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapu ni. Kia watia, kia mama, tinako. Te tinana, te waira, ki te aratangata. Koia rā e rongo, whaki irihia, ake ki ronga. Kia tina, tina, huie, tai ki. Kia ora, thank you everybody. Kia kite. Thank you.